Um, tonight we're going to be looking at uh, Genesis, the 24th chapter. And specifically, we're going to take a glance at, at a bit of text that we're going to decode for the purpose of developing a portrait of a patriarch. Often we read these, these texts, and because the, the Torah, the Tanakh, does not provide us a lot of detail, everything that is written is important. Does that make sense? It's like, even though it doesn't have a lot of detail, it all points to something else that gives us a deeper understanding. And sometimes when we go through the parasha like we do now, we're already through Abraham, and we have not really examined much about the psychological portrait of Abraham. We kind of know in general what we're talking about. He's a generous person. You know, he, he loves to um, uh, bring guests in and teach him about monotheism. I mean, we see some great character traits, but we see something in Isaac that really caught my attention. And it, I don't know, for some reason, uh, during this preparation, I felt like I, I had a personal picture of him, like a personal glimpse of the type of man he was. And, and now things sort of blossoms out. And I hope that's your same experience. In Genesis 24, 61, starting with 61, 2461, it says, And Rebekah and her maids rose, mounted the camels, and followed the man. So the servant led Rebekah and went his way. Isaac had just come. Now, Onkulo says this. Literally, it says, come in his coming. Like, what in the world does that mean? This is a, this is a coded text, okay? Come in his coming from the well, well where the living angel appeared. Has anybody ever seen this before? Oh, yeah. Verse 20, now on 62, 2462. What is uh, verse 62 on Chumash say? Can someone help me? Now Isaac came from heaven, going to the air, the high Roe, and dwelt in the region of the south. Yes, in the Gath. Right. So, the reason why Onkulos puts the text a little different is both texts are giving the same detail, but more description. Isaac, it says, had just come, and Onkelos puts in parentheses, literally come in his coming. And we'll explain what that means in a minute. From the well where the living angel appeared. What well was a living angel where a living angel appeared? Hagar. Right. So it's where Hagar prayed, and God spoke to her and showed her a well, Right. So it says, Isaac went to pray in the field toward the evening. He raised his eyes and saw, and behold, camels were coming. Rebekah also raised her eyes and saw Isaac, and she let herself down from the camel. She said to the servant, who is that man who is walking in the field toward us? The servant said, he is my master. She took a veil and covered herself. The servant told Isaac all the things that he had done, and Isaac brought her to the tent he, and uh, he saw and behold, her behavior was proper as the behavior of his mother, Sarah. He took Rebekah and she became his wife and he loved her. Thus, Isaac found comfort after his mother's death. Now, we're going to do uh, something similar. And the way I approach this is when I was in the military and someone would commit suicide, we would do a psychological autopsy. Has anybody heard that in maybe the medical field? A psychological autopsy is when you bring all the people that personally knew this individual along with, you know, proper analysts, and they sit down and they break apart everything that happened in that person's life so that we can kind of understand what was happening psychologically. And it's it, it's pretty pretty profound operation to go. And I sort of approach the same thing with the text. Now, when we look at this text, why does it mention the place from where Isaac had come and the region where he was settled and uh, 
uh, and why is it mentioned and what does it do to give us better understanding of the event? Moreover, this information is repeated again in chapter 25, verse 8 through 11. And there is a reason when something is repeated twice in a text, it says what? Hello, look, right here, is, this is an important text. It says that, and Abraham breathed his last and dying uh, at a good ripe age, old and content, and he was gathered to his kin, and his son Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Mechpelah in the field of Ephron, son of Zohar, a, a, the Hittite, facing Mamre, the field that Abraham had brought from the Hittites, where Abraham was buried, and Sarah, his wife, after the death of Abraham, God blessed his son Isaac. Now, there are two questions that we need to ask here. It says in this last part of the verse, And Isaac settled near Be'er Nahari Roy. Where is that and what does it mean? Why did the scripture take such care to mention where Isaac was living? Why was Isaac's dwelling place mentioned specifically in two passages? which we have cited. This place that is mentioned, Ba'er, are you guys all following the same place? Okay. Ba'er, uh, uh, Roy is a remote location far from the population settlements in the heart of the wilderness. It's in the Negev. It's in the south. He proposed looking, uh, we propose looking at this place, it's is in the region of Negev, as representing the character trait of Isaac himself. In the opinion of Rabbi Shimon uh, Raphael Hirsch, his parents deliberately chose to bring him there. He, was, he comments in Genesis 20, uh, 1, 20 verse 1, it says, and settled between Kadesh and Shur. He says this, we may be so bold as to say that the uh, imminent expectation of the birth of the son led Abraham and Sarah to decide to change their place of dwelling. Isaac had to be brought up in an isolated place far from harmful influences. What were the harmful influences that was, that was in society where, where they were raising? They were pagans, right? Canaanite, Canaanite worshipers. Now, even though, you know, it's, it's interesting because it says that, that in one text uh, says that Sarah had a higher prophetic level than Abraham. Why? What verse do we derive to get that from? Do y'all remember? Where Hashem says, where God says to Abraham, listen to what your wife says. Right? And it said that Sarah, and this whole idea that we, you know, we'll kind of, we'll probably won't touch on it deep in detail, but it's just the idea, for example, Sarah had a special connection and understanding about her role in the world. She understood her husband's role, but she also understood her role. And we're going to see it defined in a moment. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. So, with that being said, Raphael uh, Samson, Raphael Hirsch, uh, he goes on and says, Rabbi Hirsch has a similar comment to make on Genesis 26, uh, 2462. Just had just come back. The term also as uh, Ram, I mean, uh, of um, Ankylo says, literally come in his coming. Okay. It seems that Isaac had been living by himself in the region of Negev. Unlike Abraham, who was actually lived for several years, had lived among the people. Why was Abraham so interested in living amongst the people? Hospitality. Hospitality, teaching him about the, 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 uh, the Shavu Mitzvot, to teach him about monotheism. Isaac, from the very onset, lived in seclusion. So right now we're getting a, a, a picture of a guy who was pretty happy being to himself. He didn't have his father's mission. Right? Gabor. Say again? He was a man of great Gabor. Absolutely. Great personal strength. Absolutely. As, as a matter of fact, in one text, it's, well, I'll get to it in a second, but it says that the reason, it was first intended that he would run into Rebekah, and that they'd meet each other on a, an occasion. But it says that he would have scared her and intimidated her by the strength of his character. And that it was reason why it was important to have the servant go find him and sort of you know, uh, build up the, the circumstances. So, say again? A wingman, exactly. That's what uh, Eliezer was, right. Um, the first happening to him 
And we have to ask, why was he uh, a person very happy with seclusion? You know, there are certain people that have a temperament that is like an extroverted temperament, and they get energy off of being with groups of people. And then there are other people who are introverted, whose energy life force is sucked out of them by being around people. And they're just as happy being by themselves. Well, we have to ask, how did this happen to this young man? Was it solely because mom and dad moved him out in the country? There had to be some other things going on, right? So what, what would you think the two major events in his life caused him to be a very secluded individual, contemplative individual? That's good. Was he alive when Sodom and Gomorrah was? He would hear about it. So how about how about the Akeda? How about seeing his stepbrother sent out in the desert? Pretty traumatic stuff. Yeah, yeah, but primarily we're focusing on these two life events. I remember when I I left the military to come here to Houston to join the police department and we have to do a psychological profile deal and then you meet with a psychiatrist and he tells you whether you're too crazy to join the police department, right? And so I get in there and I do the thing and he reads all the, it says the, you know, all the, you know, on the form on a psychological thing, you list all the potential stressors, right? You know, you know, leave a job, death in the family, illness, you know, so I click off all that stuff and he looks at me and goes, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, everything's great. But for him, I was meeting all the criteria of being a guy who should be really stressed out. Well, you know, life events do stress you out, whether you, whether, regardless of how big you are or strong you are. But for a tzaddik, the life stresses, his response to it may have been for seclusion. But in the seclusion, he grew in tremendous midot and character and, and strength and he just became a very contemplative, contemplative person. Now, let's look at this. This parting took place as a result of Sarah's demand that Ishmael and his Egyptian mother, Hagar, be banished from the home. Now, it said this in Genesis 21.10, The son of that slave shall not share in the inheritance of my son Isaac. Sounds pretty cruel, doesn't it? I think it does. But let me tell you why. The sages say, no, it's not cruel. Because Sarah had one mission. That one mission was her one son, Isaac. And her mission was to raise Isaac in a home of purity without disruption. And she was not interested in bringing Torah to the world. That was her husband's job. Now that she has a son, her home, her son is her mission. That's my mission. And I'm not going to have anything in my house that's going to detract from me being able to teach my son the values that he needs to learn. So it's better for her to just hit the road, Jack. Don't you come back. No more. Right. She was the one that gave Hagar. It was her idea. Okay. It was her idea. And I, and I think she did chuva. It was like, okay, it's my idea, but it's a bad one. So now get, it, get rid of it. Ah, uh, interesting. I haven't read that. I haven't read that. That's good. So the whole idea is that that this was a pretty traumatic thing for Isaac. He he's a young boy, and he sees this brother that he obviously played games with, had a relationship, all of a sudden be sent out of the house. It's like that's pretty traumatic. Second trauma, of course, would be his near sacrifice upon rising from the altar. We see that Abraham returns back with two of his servants, but Isaac wasn't with him. So where did he go? Some says he went and studied with Shem at the Academy of Shem and Aver. But, in right. And how far from where the sacrifice took place? Yes. We're talking about 200 yards, maybe. Maybe 200 yards. He literally walked down and started his school. Yes. Um, the commentary says that a later wife, Torah, was actually 
Yeah, we're going to get to that. Yeah, save, save that. That's good. That's really good. And we're going to point out the verse as to why that's the case, because we talked about this uh, the other night. So, um, so the idea here is, is what happened to him and where did he go? So it says there's one he went to study. Uh, Shem is found in Genesis Rabbah, uh, the Albach edition, page 56, uh, portion 19. Actually, 56, 19 on page 161. I'm 611. And it says, so where did Isaac go? The Holy One, blessed be he, he took him. It, there's another one that says in Midrash HaGadol about this text. It says that he was taken to the Garden of Eden. Interesting. Is that a metaphor, maybe? Metaphor to maybe a place of enlightenment and study? Kind of like that experience Moshe had on top of Mount Sinai. Correct. Correct. And so we... And it says that he was taken there because there was some repair that needs, needed to be done. That's one view. Here's another one. Perhaps he remained there on Mount Moriah for three years until he reached the age of 40 and married Rebecca. So one or the other or all three of them could be right because the uh, Mount Moriah and, and Jerusalem, they co-locate. They're right in the same place. Now, in our view of our remarks... In viewer remarks, one might add another explanation. Isaac went into the wilderness to live in seclusion and contemplate the emotional impact of his, of his second formative event of his life. Or had he gone to where Hagar and Ishmael were? Now, this is an interesting concept. Oh, this will get your eyebrows raised. Or had he gone to where Hagar and Ishmael were living in the wilderness of Paran? Why do we say that? Because it says he was coming from the well where the angel appeared. Hagar settled where the well was at. Okay? So thus the answer to our following first question seems to be that the Torah mentioned that Isaac was living in order uh, to attest to his secluded life, which then had an impact on the two events mentioned in the beginning of this article. This, his first encounter with Ref, uh, Rebecca and his response to Abraham's death, to further, further clarify the point, let's consider the remarks of the uh, Nathiv of Z uh, Zalotzin in his commentary on Ha'amek Devar, on Genesis 24, 6, 2. He says this, Scripture tells us that the Almighty, who directs the steps of a man, arranged that Isaac would chance upon Rebecca along the way, and that she could uh, she uh, would be startled by him from the first encounter. But if the servant had first come with her to Abraham's home, Abraham would have been first to receive her, and he would be uh, would able to conjole her and, until her spirits were eased, and she would not be frightened by her fear of Isaac. It's interesting. So rather, the Holy One, blessed be he, caused Isaac to have uh, been on his way from Be'er Lahai Roi, for that was the special place for him for prayer and seclusion by the well where the angel had appeared. Yes, sir. That, that phrase, Be'er Lahai Roi, yeah. uh, Lahai Roi is uh, the shepherd of the living. Yes. The well of the shepherd. Right. Of the and we're going to see a connection with the last part of that that is going to be connected to Hagar's name change. It's so cool. So what? The first, so the, the, um, so to know, uh, the patriarch Isaac is referred to as the fear of Isaac, Genesis, Genesis 31, 42, because of the great sense of awe he inspired in those who saw him. A trait he acquired by the virtue of the binding of Isaac. So in the whole binding of Isaac, something happened in his character traits. I mean, something strengthened and became very powerful because he had an understanding of Hashem and his role in the world. I mean, it's like it solidified and matured him. One of the things that I, I've noticed with, uh, and, and my son and I had talked about this extensively, being a, an, a combat veteran, eight tours, he's on his eighth, eighth mission right now, and he notices the friends that he grew up in high school with that didn't have any of those kinds of experience, he said they lag behind, you know, 10 years in maturity. They just, they're still doing stupid stuff like high school students do. 
And he said, you know, he's still their, their good friends, but he realizes that when you go through a trial by fire, something changes in your character. And this is what we're talking about. Um, so it is the Holy One, blessed be he, who designed this whole meeting between Refka and Isaac when he is returning from his most deep state of meditation and prayer. He was at the well. Now, this is an important time of seclusion for him. And it appears from the text that we'll examine that this was something he did on a regular basis. This was his life. Taking another look at the verse we, we cited in the opening of the article, at the same moment Abraham's servant met Refka by the spring, Genesis 24, 45, Isaac was by the well where the Lord had revealed himself to Hagar. Now, we can understand this reaction of the young damsel who, who for the first time in her life encountered the fear of Isaac. Raising her, her eyes in her eyes, Rebecca saw Isaac. She uh, lit off and fell or fell from the camel, jumped off. Thus, we see the remarks of the Netziv who explains our second question. The Torah mentions the place where Isaac was coming to meet Rebekah because the fact that he was coming from Be'er Lahai Roy at the precise time had an effect on the married life. Isaac bounced back and forth physically and emotionally between his parents' home, his obligation to his, his bereaved father who lost his wife, and also to Hagar and his stepbrother. Back and forth back and forth. He'd go pray, he would come back, and he would visit his father. But it seems by the time he gets to this story of Rebecca, and he takes her in the tent, oh, everything changed. He finally felt the comfort because Rebecca was just like his mother, right? You never want to tell your wife that you're just like my mother. But in that case, it's a great quality, right? He seemed to be comforted and things shifted. But it was it was during these secluded years before he met his wife, from 37 to 40, just a few years, he spent back and forth sort of torn between. Now the reason why that we can see that there was that possible connection, because when Abraham died, who was at the funeral? I mean, when, when Sarah died, who was at the funeral? Both of them. They were great relations. There was no animosity between the two boys. When his father died, the same thing. They were at the tomb. Now, Isaac habitually went to that place, it being a place of prayer for him to account of the angel having appeared there, and he was living in the Negev region not far from there. In other words, Isaac came to his mother's tent on his way back from coming, i.e., from the habitual trips to and from the place where the well is located. The swinging of this pendulum did not cease until he found consolation in his wife, says Isaac brought her in the tent of his, 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 the tent of his mother Sarah, and he took Rebekah as his wife. Isaac loved and found comfort after his mother's death. It seemed that at some level Isaac was wrestling with his purpose and who he was and trying to find out where he was supposed to go. He had to dig, there's another reference, he had to dig his own wells. You, you understand me? Abraham had his wells, he had to take care of digging his own. Now according to the, another homily, I, Isaac also saw his father remarry, remarry. Genesis Rabbah, chapter 60, the, the Freeman edition, page 537, it says this, And Isaac came from coming, etc., and whether had he gone, where did he go? To Be'er Lachai Roy. He had gone to fetch Hagar. The one who had sat by the well and besought him, who is the word life by all words, saying, look upon my misery. This is Hagar's words. More directly in Midrash, uh, Tanhuma, the Warsaw edition, Parashat, uh, Hayai Sarah, paragraph 8, says this. Isaac said, I have gotten me a wife, and it is fitting for my father to have a wife. Why does Rabbi say that Keturah was none other than Hagar, which was mentioned? Because it says of Isaac, 
Isaac had just come back from the vicinity of Be'er, the Ha'iroi, and th the same well of which it is written, and she called the Lord and spoke to her. You are El Roy. What is Hagar's, what's the new woman's name that he's supposed to have married? Keturah, right. So he says, El Roy, from this we learned that she was Hagar, right? This also explains why scripture mentions her uh, where Isaac went to live after Abraham's death to indicate that henceforth he had no need to oscillate back and forth between the two points. The gap left by his mother after passing was filled by his beautiful wife, Sarah. So in the end, what do we get? This whole profile of a patriarch, meaning a man that had his, his battles, yet his difficulties, and yet his focus was like a still hard focus on continuing to grow and develop. Abraham wanted to make a mini-me out of Isaac, and it worked. It worked. An amazing man that we're going to see. But he was a normal man. And I guess the thing is, is we sometimes see the patriarchs as wearing big capes with a big P on the front, and that's not the case. These were normal men, but they were tzaddiks. They were great, righteous men. That concludes this discussion. We can now go to the second part, which would be discussion of the text or, or discussion of what I just lectured on. So.